What's up guys, Kudokun here. I find that when it comes to reviewing games, it takes a long time to beat games, and sometimes I don't even get around to beating some games, so it makes sort of making these reviews really slow. But I have an idea for a new type of review called an ongoing review, where what I'd like to do is make a small review every time I finish a pretty meaty part of a game, and then just give my thoughts as it goes along. Then if I decide not to finish a video game, then I can just get on here and talk about what my thoughts are, and you guys will still know. And I think this will scratch the itch that old Let's Plays and uh, old podcasts and stuff used to scratch, where you can essentially just hear my thoughts on a game as I'm going through it without all of the annoying uh, editing and stuff. <laughs> it's funny that after I say that, I do edit a part in, but... If I decide not to finish a game, I'll come on here and I'll make something called a final review where I'll give my thoughts on the game and just explain why I decided not to finish it. And if I do finish a game, then the final review will be what my thoughts on the game were overall. But either way, I do hope you enjoy and we're getting started with Etrian Odyssey Nexus. The last time I looked at an Etrian Odyssey game, I think people got the wrong idea about me. Uh, people thought that I hated Etrian Odyssey games and I don't. I really don't. My argument was that Etrian games are better when they have a story, and I think most dungeon crawler games are better when they have a good story, because the gameplay can get really repetitive, and that's the thing that can keep you going. If the gameplay is repetitive, it's okay as long as there's something cool that's going to happen after you get through a certain part of the game, and for me personally, I like the story-driven elements. So I like, uh, for example, Persona Q. Persona Q is an amazing game. I know Persona Q2 is going to be an amazing game. I like Etrian Odyssey Untold, where they go back and they redo the first game with an optional story mode. And look, if you don't like story in your Etrian Odyssey, that is your prerogative. I'm not telling you you're wrong for not wanting story in your Etrian Odyssey. But what I'm saying is the Etrian Odyssey games feel a lot stronger to me when there is a story. You cannot like story. I can like story, we can both live in harmony, and a game that offers both a story and no story are just going to be better overall, because they give both of us the option to enjoy the game we want to enjoy them. Going into Etrian Odyssey Nexus, you have to understand what it is. It's essentially a compilation love letter to all of the mainline Etrian Odyssey games that have been released so far. So you've got stuff from all five of the main Etrian Odysseys, you've got uh, all of the classes that have been released so far essentially, so all 20 classes in the previous games have been brought over, with some noticeable retractions as far as older content goes. Uh, one thing I was very disappointed to see is they took the races from Etrian Odyssey 5 out, which is a very strange move to me. One of the arguments people have for me is that they like Etrian Odyssey the way it is without a story because they like to make up their own story and uh, they see it as more of a Dungeons & Dragons style role-playing experience, which I'm totally okay with and I do see the uh, similarities. It does seem like it would scratch the Dungeons & Dragons itch if that's the itch you have, but something I've always thought was weird about the Etrian... <laughs> Something I've always thought is weird about the Etrian Odyssey games in comparison to other games in the genre is you don't actually have very good customization options. You can choose between like a few hair colors, a few clothes colors, and like your gender, but that's really about it when it comes to customization. And if this game is going to rely so heavily on role-playing being a main selling point of the game, having less customization is a very strange move. The races at least added a little bit of variety to how the characters could look, so you could have uh, a harbinger that was like a human, or you could have one that was like uh, the, the elf dudes. I'm sorry guys, I'm really, I'm not like a huge Etrian Odyssey nerd, so I don't really know everything about the other Etrian Odyssey games. Usually I get bored of an Etrian Odyssey game and I quit it very early on. And I apologize, but uh, well, all, all I'm saying is they came up with the idea of races in Etrian Odyssey 5, and it's very strange that even though the classes from Etrian Odyssey 5 got carried over, the races didn't get carried over. It would have helped a lot with character customization and the actual role-playing experience. The battle system, I mean, what can you really say about Etrian Odyssey's battle system? It's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's kind of like the Dragon Quest battle system in that you know, it's just so core that why would they ever change it? 
Uh, really doesn't seem to be the case here either. There's something called focus in the game, which I honestly, honestly don't remember if it was in one of the other games, but I will say that for this game, the focus idea is kind of cool. Um, not really enough to change up the gameplay enough for me to say that it's like a huge revolution, but it is a pretty nice little touch. You have focus blasts, which are like big special moves you can do, and then uh, another type of focus that just gives you like a support move, and um, honestly, both of them are pretty nice. You'll only ever really use them in boss battles or foe encounters, but they're, they're not bad. They're, they're not a bad addition. Honestly, I find myself a lot more interested in this Etrian Odyssey than I was Etrian Odyssey 5 because it seems like they're trying to tell a story and uh, it's not too bad so far. There's an island that's popped up that everybody's flocking to because they want to see uh, what kind of treasures and special cool stuff is on this little island and nobody's really explored it so far so you actually get sort of a first look and you get to see how people are reacting to this new place. And the thing that makes it so mysterious is this new place seems to have a lot of elements from other lands in the worlds that come from the other Etrian Odyssey games. So the TLDR version is all of the other Etrian Odyssey games are converged into one place and everybody wants to know why. They bring in a lot of NPCs that actually can travel around with you and have conversations with you, which is an element that I absolutely love. And I think these are characters from other Etrian Odyssey games, but again, I can't say for certain that they are from other Etrian Odyssey games, but it does give off that vibe. Um, a lot of the areas have the exact same name they did in their original Etrian Odyssey game, so it should be fun fan service for anybody who gets a chance to play. Probably my personal favorite feature is instead of just going to one dungeon and then going through all of the floors, because that's normally how Etrian Odyssey works, is you pick a dungeon and you go floor one, two, three, four, boss, and then you get another dungeon one two three four boss or one two three four five boss if they really want to mix it up but the scenery doesn't really change and uh the questing doesn't really change that much but in this game they actually have a world map where sometimes when you get a quest you won't go straight to a dungeon what you'll do is you'll go to a smaller mini map and you'll play through that to do the quest and I think it's pretty nice. I, I think it fleshes the game out a lot to actually have mini areas you can go to rather than just go straight into the big dungeon to do all of your questing. Because if you just go into a dungeon and grind the quests there, it, the scenery gets boring real fast. Uh, the battles get really boring because at that point you're so strong. Nothing's really a challenge for you. And uh, they're more of a nuisance than anything else. And I just think it's a very nice touch to actually have smaller areas to sort of give you some variety while you're playing. Uh, really, really cool addition. Right now I'm about seven hours in. I'm not totally sure I'm going to end up beating this game. It's I'm getting a little bit of the Etrian Odyssey fatigue that I always get. Uh, I don't really know how much longer I can go on. But I know I'm going to put at least a few more hours in, so there should be at least one more of these video updates to go. Right now, I am enjoying it. I'm enjoying it a little bit more than five, though the loss of races is just, it's baffling to me, like actually baffling. And uh, I think that if you're a fan of Etrian Odyssey, this is pretty much a must play because if as long as you're not tired of the Etrian Odyssey games yet, there's just so much fan service here for you and uh, nothing's really changed too much. So if you enjoy it, you're going to enjoy this too. Uh, and I highly recommend picking it up. Right now, I'm feeling the game is hovering somewhere between a 5 out of 10 or a 6 out of 10. So it is a slightly above average game. I don't know if it's high enough above average that I would say it's like a game I would recommend to people outside of hardcore Etrian Odyssey fans. But I mean, it's a good game. It's pretty nice and I'm really enjoying myself so far. So if you've been playing Etrian Odyssey Nexus on your own time, then please leave your thoughts on it in the comment section below, and I will see you guys in the next part. Stay tuned.